Welcome back, guys. We're starting episode 22 of the England series. So, just as the Bible promises will happen to evildoers, Archbishop Lodge's cruelty came back on his own head. Parliament clapped him into prison with the unhappy Thomas Wentworth, but he was not executed. Yet. You may remember, however, speaking of Wentworth, that Earl's fear that a war was brewing in Britain. This was indeed the truth, and a fear shared by many men. Supporters of the king and supporters of parliament were getting angry with one another, and riots became more and more frequent in London and other cities. To try and avoid a coming disaster, parliament wrote up a document, the Protestation of 1641. Uh, wrong document. Here we go. But before we talk about the content of this document, I think it'll be more helpful if I explain the name first. Protestation here doesn't mean protest, like it's used in the word Protestant. Rather, in this case, it means declaration. So if we were to interpret the title, we could simply call it the Declaration of 1641. This declaration was an oath of allegiance to the king and the state church and it was decreed that this oath must be taken by every Englishman over the age of 18. Copies of it were sent throughout all the country to the sheriffs, who, in turn, read the oath in church, and afterwards all the men were demanded to sign their names on the paper. This was a very effective way of getting everyone to agree to the protestation, for everyone went to church. The Anglican church, that is. It's not as if everyone was really so pious, they were basically forced to go. If they didn't come to church, then they had to pay a fine. Anyway, most of the men did sign the oath, but some simply refused. Lists were kept of these dissenters, marking them as suspicious. So why exactly did Parliament write this protestation of 1641? Well, they hoped if everyone took this oath to support the king and church, that it would remind them of their so-called duties to the state, help them forget their anger against the king and church, and unite them in a single cause. Simply put, they thought that this one piece of paper would truly make people loyal and bring peace. Of course we know this is silly, for first of all, saying words or signing a paper can't change a man's heart. And secondly, Jesus clearly tells us that we shouldn't take oaths. Matthew 5, 34-37 says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So, by making people swear the oath, the king and parliament were actually making people disobey God. Therefore, it's unsurprising when we find that this protestation didn't do any good. It didn't unite anyone, and it didn't bring peace. Tensions in the kingdom continued to grow worse. Also, in this year of 1641, a final peace treaty was written up with the Covenanters. The Scots were given permission to choose their own bishops, instead of having ones appointed by the king, and Covenanters were allowed to be part of the king's Scottish Privy Council. And just to give a little bit of background here, the Privy Council was a small group of special men that gave the king advice. And before this time, no Covenanters had been allowed to be part of the group. Anyway, satisfied with this, the Scots then withdrew from Newcastle and returned home. It may have looked as if there was peace once more in England, but it was a deceiving peace. King Charles and his supporters, the Royalists, hated the things that Parliament was doing, and certainly didn't trust them. And, uh, well... The mistrust was a shared one. Parliament viewed the royal party with equal hostile suspicion. 
Echoes of coming trouble drifted down from the north and from across the Irish Sea to the west. A mysterious plot to kidnap three Covenanter leaders had narrowly failed. A fanatic group of Catholics rose up in Ulster, a province in Ireland, and massacred several Protestant settlers there that had come over from England and Scotland. This was not comforting news to the already fearful Protestants back in England. Rumors started to spread. Had Charles been involved in either of these horrible plots? There wasn't any proof, but people still suspected him. The rumors made relations between the king and parliament worse still, but the very worst was yet to come. 